Well, here it is, folks, the video that you probably won't get anywhere else on YouTube. A legal breakdown of the settlement that AMC and the plaintiffs have agreed to, but hasn't exactly been approved yet. It'll, we'll get into the legal stuff and the ramifications and all that. But first, some housekeeping. Number one, I know I talked about dealing with the hot takes and all the stupid idiocy that's been flying around YouTube and Twitter surrounding this settlement, but that's going to have to wait because it's already 11.30 here. I don't know if I'm even going to get this out by Wednesday. I guess we'll find out when this gets posted, right? So that's going to be its own video. This is just going to be the legal stuff. Second, I, I have to say, I can't be the only one who, after thinking about it, thought it was a little odd that this settlement came out on the same day that AMC decided to announce its date for the Q1 2023 earnings call. I mean, it could be a total coincidence, but it almost feels like they saw the numbers for Q1 or and were just like, holy shit, we need to make this lawsuit go away now. We do not have the liquidity to fuck around and find out. Give the, Pay them shares. Just get this lawsuit to go away because unless we can start, you know, bringing in more liquidity and more cash by offering new shares, we're kind of screwed right now. So make it happen. And I did kind of go over this when I was talking about the earnings call from Q4 2022 and end of year earnings that AMC right now is kind of living on borrowed time. Second bit of housekeeping goes out to the one who just recently blocked me. Thomas James, you fucking twat. And a coward, too, with that. You see, I called out Thomas on Twitter for his disingenuous tweet of calling the settlement ha the case was thrown out. And then, come to find out when I actually look at the video, he said, oh, the case has been thrown out. And then quietly buries the lead of it's a settlement. Today, I want to talk about how the AMC lawsuit has finally been thrown out. I want to explain how and why it was thrown out or settled. What a disingenuous fucking prick. You know, normally, I don't have too many problems with these people that do these videos that are ill-informed. I may disagree with them, or they may say things that I think are completely incorrect. But there's a certain level of douchebaggery required to have such an ego trip moment that you're lying to your audience. And I know exactly why he was doing this. Because in his last video on the AMC lawsuit, he promised his audience that this lawsuit would be thrown out. It'd be dismissed by April 27th at the latest. But obviously, fortunately, this lawsuit will soon be thrown out as frivolous, at least at April 27th at the latest. And now that it's going to settlement, he needs to cover his ass and protect his fragile fucking ego. Now on to the proposed settlement, and I say that not for semantics, not to be pedantic, that is the situation, as the court still needs to approve it. Now the TLDR on that agreement, I'm sure you all are well aware of, but let's go over it again. Both the parties agreed to the payment of 6,922,566 shares of Class A common stock post-completion of the corporate action pursuant to the proposals approved at the March 14th shareholder meeting. Now, of course, all of that is contingent on the status quo order being lifted because you can't exactly have shares post the corporate action until the status quo order is lifted. So you have this sort of catch-22 going on here. These are shares that will be paid to the entire class in the lawsuit, which would be the, the current Class A common shareholders. So all of the eight preferred will be excluded from this. And since it is a all share transaction, that means that it's more or less like a split, a, uh, a dividend split, sort of like how Ape was. Though, as Chancery Daily noted in her article on the subject, this seems rather rushed. And she seems to feel that this is an implication that AMC and the plaintiffs are trying to pigeonhole Vice Chancellor Zern into approving this. And while I don't exactly have the legal knowledge or experience or wherewithal to be able to have any idea if that's true or not, to me, I think this 
harkens back to the little bit of housekeeping I said about AMC's liquidity issues. I will note something specifically for in the article, though, that may be of note for this situation, especially what Chancery Daily has brought up. And that is a specific part of the Steel Connect shareholder litigation transcript where this sort of thing was specifically pointed out by, well, what do you know, Vice Chancellor Zern? Where parties perform settlement obligations without seeking court approval of the settlement, the parties improperly circumvent the protections afforded to class members and stockholders by Rules 23 and 23.1. Those cases find that in such circumstances, the settlement is untimely presented and the court should not consider those aspects of a settlement in determining whether the settlement is fair and reasonable. Basically, do not play fuck around and find out with the Court of Chancery. The problem for AMC, though, and to a certain extent plaintiffs about trying to rush through this, is that this sort of process is not meant to be rushed. When you have such a large class in this class action lawsuit, and a very diverse one, especially in the case of the meme stock community that surrounds AMC, this process is not one that is likely to be rushed. And from my understanding, as far as Vice Chancellor Zern, she's not one to exactly go in guns blazing and rush through something. She's going to take her time to make sure that it is done properly. And what is the proper process so we've already gone through step one of the process. The two parties have come together and made a proposed settlement. The next step is to go to a preliminary settlement, which means that it has to be preliminarily approved by Vice Chancellor Zern. And there are two cases that lay out the framework for determining the process of approving a preliminary settlement. And these both come from Chickering v. Giles, and SS&C Tech Incorporated Shareholder Litigation. Both of these cases still have the same standard. The only real difference is that in SS&C Tech Incorporated, the class hadn't been certified yet before the settlement came, and so there's a little bit of more nuance there. And I can't recall if the class had actually been certified in this case with AMC so this one might be more applicable, but it may not be. Either way, the four-part test for the standard of getting a preliminarily approved settlement is the same in both. The four factors are 1. Strength of the plaintiff's case 2. The risk of continued litigation 3. The extent of discovery completed and 4. The probability of success at trial I'm going to go ahead and give my opinions here pretty shortly, but I want to, you know, see what everyone else seems to think on this four-part test. If you want to add your own opinions on this, go ahead and post in the comments. We'll make this a, a group project. Number one, I've already stated in the last video I did what I think about the strength of the plaintiff's case. It's pretty weak at this point. Number two, uh, risk of continued litigation. Yeah, that's that's more than likely. The plaintiffs have made it pretty clear they're at least going to go to the injunction hearing, and who knows when Vice Chancellor Zern would get back on responding to that with her opinion. And after that, you'd have to deal with the motion to dismiss, you get briefs on that, and then you'd have to get a ruling on that one after a hearing. So there is some risk of continued litigation. There's at least two months at the very least, of continued litigation. Three, the extended discovery completed. There's been a reasonable amount of discovery. I mean, that was supposed to end this week for the injunction hearing. So there's already been a, a pretty decent amount of discovery by both parties. Um, point four, probability of success at trial. Well, that kind of ties into one for me. I don't think there's a particular success for the plaintiffs past this point. I think that given all of that, if you look at these standards, I think it's a pretty compelling settlement. Is it the greatest settlement in the world for the plaintiffs? No. But given their position, it's a pretty fucking good settlement, in my opinion. And I think at this point, it's good to mention that while this settlement does not create dilution for AMC, that lawyers do not work for free. Either they're being paid by the named plaintiffs who will 
have to more than likely sell their shares to pay the lawyers or the lawyers are getting a cut of the shares which they will promptly sell to take cash because I don't think they are particularly interested in holding shares of AMC. Then of course you have what was pointed out in the 8K. Since it is a one additional share from the settlement for every seven and a half shares a shareholder owns, there's going to be some level of fractional shares and they are not giving out fractional shares. Instead, they are going to sell a whole share and pay out in cash to those with fractional shares from the proceeds. So depending on how many of those that have to be done, there's going to be forced selling to deal with that implication. And you have to remember that this is 4.5% of the float post the corporate action. And while I'm not saying that all of that will be, you know, sold out or anything like that, you have to wonder what part of that will be because that will affect AMC's price once this all gets taken care of. Now, assuming Vice Chancellor Zern approves this proposed settlement, it becomes a preliminary settlement. And once that happens, then the door opens up for shareholders to be informed of the settlement, notified, and given their right to object to it. And if those objections are anything like the emails that have been sent to Vice Chancellor Zern, I fully anticipate this to be a three-ring circus act. Something along the lines of the AVCTQ bankruptcy hearing, if you haven't seen that video on this channel. And that's assuming if they even file with the court. I planned on doing a follow-up video on Al from Boston's letter writing campaign, and that no one in the Delaware Court of Chancery is reading those. Benny. Nobody cares! Nobody cares! And those emails won't be admissible as objections to the settlement that is proposed. In order to have standing in front of a court, you need to actually file with the court. And there are only two ways that any sort of objections will be heard. And that is by making a written filing to the court or by appearing for oral arguments, which usually requires you to file anyway and let the court know you're going to be there. And I can, with 100% certainty, guarantee that your emails are only going to one place, and that's the round file. Past that, the court will take the objections under consideration and rule on it. Me personally, I think that this settlement will be approved anyway. But then again, I'm also not the Honorable Vice Chancellor Zern, so who knows? But if she does approve it, I would like to speak directly to the people who are so vehement about ensuring that this litigation continues, specifically to case law from 1991 that's still applicable today as precedent, and that's Kahn versus Sullivan. Kahn vs. Sullivan happened as a result of then-CEO of Occidental Petroleum wanting to set up a philanthropic endeavor that would result in corporate charitable donations that Oxy could take advantage of for a tax write-down. To spare you the long and short of it, they did some research on it, it was put up for shareholder vote, and from that process there were three shareholder litigations that happened. Those three were Kahn, Sullivan, and Stepak. During this litigation process, Sullivan sought and was granted a settlement on the shareholder litigation, and Kahn and Stepak sued to enjoin via preliminary injunction the settlement. The Delaware Court of Chancery denied the motion, and it was appealed to the Delaware Supreme Court. The Delaware Supreme Court affirmed the decision unanimously, and Justice Holland, writing on behalf of the court, said, the court's role in reviewing the proposed settlement is quite restricted. The court will not substitute its judgment for that of parties in evaluating the reasonableness of the settlement. The ultimate standard of fairness, reasonableness, and adequacy of the settlement depends on whether the settlement is within the range of reasonableness given all the risks of litigation. And the settlement amount must reflect the strength of the plaintiff's case and must also reflect appropriate compromise given the risks and expenses of continued litigation. At the end of the day, regardless of how affronted you might be at this particular settlement, 
or your want to have this litigation go through to completion, you are not the only party to this lawsuit. It is an entire class of AMC shareholders of which you are a part of. And the court will seek to find the best outcomes for the most people. So before you get to writing your lawsuit for appeal or rendering that the judgment is unfair, keep in mind that whatever ruling that the Delaware Court of Chancery comes to, more than likely the Delaware Supreme Court is going to uphold it because it's not just your interests that are going to be considered. It is the interest of the entire class and the cost of the litigation and the likelihood of winning on the merits. It may not be an outcome you'll like, but it's an outcome you'll get anyway. And with that, I believe everything is covered. Hopefully that helped you better understand the process that's going forward. So until next time, I'll catch you folks later.